I'm Neil Wyshynski and I'm uh, chair of the uh, Board of Selectmen. And the Board of Selectmen is uh, the, probably the closest thing to uh, mayor that uh, the town has. Um, we have a, a board of uh, five uh, individuals, uh, all of whom are very engaged and uh, enthusiastic. And uh, I, I like to think about it as uh, five for one. Uh, a city has uh, one mayor. We have uh, five selectmen. Um, and it's, it seems to work. Brookline Can is, is, a, is a really important organization. Um, uh, the, uh, Brookline Can has really been engaging um, in town government, advocating for seniors, for uh, pedestrian improvements, for streetscape improvements, and uh, headed by uh, Frank Caro, who uh, is a person I really uh, uh, admire, um, and have served with him and, and his wife Carol uh, on uh, many committees. Um, most recently, uh, a committee uh, advocating for complete streets with Frank's uh, focus has been uh, pedestrian improvements. And Frank and, uh, and Brookline Can has been very uh, influential and uh, uh, has really uh, 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 influenced town policy and has really advocated for change. And uh, it's, it's, he's, they've been very effective. The one thing about a town um, is that a town is run by volunteers, which really provides an opportunity for uh, citizens to engage and really influence uh, town policy and town government. And uh, uh, power of engagement um, uh, is, is, is really the way our town operates. If we didn't have engaged citizens, we wouldn't have a town. We'd really have to convert to a city. Um, engagement is really what makes Brookline tick. I am Cindy Katzoff. I'm the Director of Resident Services at the Coleman House, which is a JCHE community, and I'm also the Director of Community Engagement for all of JCHE. Um, I came to the event to represent my organization, JCHE, and it's important to us as a, um, as a provider of senior adult housing because we do a lot to keep our residents as engaged as possible in the community, and we also invite the community into where our residents live to share programming and to share you know, conversation and socialization because we believe it is just so important to who they are and to how well they age and it happens to work out really well. We have two particular programs, one a community calendar that we just won an award from Leading Age uh, Massachusetts because, for collaboration, so that's very exciting and it's new news. And we also do a Wednesday program for senior adults and at that program we invite everybody that's a senior in the community to come and enjoy a full day of programming at our building on Wednesdays from 10.30 in the morning till 4.15 in the afternoon. So I think BCAN is extremely important um, to what we do at JCHE and to all of the community because engaging people in advocacy for senior adults, which is you know my specialty, is incredibly important to how people age and to how well they're going to do in society and in their own families, in their own lives. So with BCAN being an amazing advocate for seniors and other people, they get the word out and they're able to push a, an agenda that is really senior friendly and for that you know we're really grateful that they exist and that they're willing to do this for all people not only in Brookline but it spreads out because as you know we have buildings in other communities we look to see what's going on with BCAN and how they're um, addressing these issues and then we can bring it into the other communities that we serve. The Brookline Community Aging Network is essential to ensuring that the town of Brookline maintains its livable status age-friendly and has a group of volunteers maintaining all those services. And the power of engagement is essential to keeping seniors active, secure, and connected. And what we see here as a elder care community is that engagement keeps seniors young, healthy, we actually just heard a lecture from Dr. Butson on Alzheimer's disease, and the two recommendations for keeping Alzheimer's at bay was exercise and staying active in your community. So I can't think of a better way to 
um, talk about engagement with that as, as a um, theme that it will keep Alzheimer's away. Dr. Swanee Jett, I'm the Health Commissioner for Brookline Health and Human Services. You know, one of the reasons I'm here for BCAN is pretty much to become more antiquated with the things that they have going on, um, to be involved with um, the aging population. Um, they also have committees that really make it age friendly. They just went through the program uh, with the World Health Organization to become an age friendly community. So I want to become more acclimated to the community, what they're doing, what BCAN is doing and how the health department can help, um, how we can be involved doing community health assessments, making sure that people have a good place they could work, um, if they still work and they can walk, um, and assess transportation as they need to. Uh, the theme of power and engagement um, is it, really to make sure that BCAN is engaged with the population overall, but mainly focused in with the elder population, uh, making sure they have all the health care needs they are. Um, recently, I just had a conversation about our eBuddies program, and it really was to ensure that they are prepared in case there's a natural disaster. Um, so being able to provide those tools and resources, making sure people are aware that the changes might occur in Medicare, and we provide immunizations, um, and you know, all sorts of things to make sure that you know, people can live healthy, um, longer life, extended life, and also be prepared for the, the end of life planning as well. And so these things are very critical when you talk about BCAN. And um, just the power of engagement, bringing the community out to actually promote that um, it, it is a kudos to them. I'm Frank Carroll. I'm the uh, co-chair of the steering committee of the Brookline Community Aging Network. And I'm also chair of the Livable Community Advocacy Committee. Well, this is uh, 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 the annual celebration for Brookline Can. This is uh, kind of an opportunity for all of the people who are involved with us, all of our members to come, come together and uh, get uh, socialized and to learn a little bit about our accomplishments and, uh, some, and learn about some of the themes uh, that we're pursuing. And, you know, and I hope it uh, will deepen their involvement with us. And I hope it will also help to bring some new people in. Yeah, I you know, think it's really extraordinarily important for older people to be involved in the life of the community. And so, uh, you know, when I think of engagement, I think of uh, involvement in, in community affairs. And uh, that's what uh, Brookline Can is all about. You know, we, we look on Brookline as a great place for older people to live, and we want older people to be involved in all aspects of community life. So uh, we try to help them to make that connection. We call attention to the good things that Brookline offers, and we try to make Brookline a little better place uh, for older people and for everyone else. And we want older people to have a role in uh, telling the Brookline story and in working to make things better. My name is Tommy Vitolo. I am a town meeting member from Precinct 6. I live in Brookline Village with my wife and my two little kids. Uh, the oldest of whom attends Pierce School, and uh, I'm here uh, as a town meeting member and, and, and representing uh, younger people uh, so that we can get to know the seniors a little better and work together on all sorts of issues around town. So we're at the Brookline Community Aging Network annual meeting, and it's a great opportunity for seniors to learn about different programs that they can take part in. Um, both benefit from but also volunteer in and participate in. But it's also a great opportunity for uh, the rest of the town to come in and, and learn what's out there uh, that we can participate in as well. And uh, I think it's, it's really important for us to think about intergenerational conversations and communications. It's a real opportunity uh, for us youngsters to learn from, from the more senior members of our community and and pull from their wisdom and their experiences uh, in moving forward and shaping a 21st century Brookline. I think the power of engagement is the opportunity to learn uh, by listening um, actively and by learning from other members of our community. We can better understand how to work together, how to uh, benefit from each other's skills and talents and interests, uh, and that ends up meaning that we all live in a better community for all of us. Uh, the power of engagement is about 
uh, recognizing that we are a community and and by working together we end up having a much better go of it. I am Erin Kinney and I am representing Brookline Interactive Group. This event is uh, the Brookline Community Aging Network. It's the annual meeting. Um, it's my first time actually at this event, but it looks like a really great opportunity for people in the community that really care about aging and senior citizens to come together and network and talk about resources and ways that we can further help this, uh, this segment of the community and this population. So uh, my job title is actually managing manager of engagement and education, so engagement is a huge part of my life uh, and my career and my focus. So what engagement is, is it's, it's, it's not just getting people to pay attention, it's getting them to care and want to connect and actually it, it, by engaging it means showing up and listening and talking to each other, participating, um, connecting to other groups and coming up with new ideas. Um, so and how is the power of it? It, it connects it connects our community. There's Unity's been thrown around a whole ton. That sounds great, but you get a real sense of community and connection and a unified sense of purpose when different groups are coming together and finding commonalities of goals and purpose and working together to really achieve those things and make it happen and help improve things in the community. <laughs> My name is Margaret Bush. Uh, I've lived in Brookline since 1992. Uh, and I have recently served four years as president of the League of Women Voters. Uh, and tonight they're receiving uh, a nice award here. We haven't worked with them too closely, but we certainly uh, have uh, watched the programs that they put on, and we've certainly promoted their programs uh, as well. We do have a lot of common uh, interests, and we do work, the League does work with a number of organizations, especially in co-sponsored programs. Uh, the term engagement is really important today. Uh, to me, it means being active uh, and participating, and we need many more people to participate in lots of different ways uh, in the community and in dialogue with one another uh, right here in our community and, of course, uh, around the state and in the country as well. My name is Alice Bonner and I'm the Secretary of the Executive Office of Elder Affairs. I work for Governor Charlie Baker and Lieutenant Governor Karen Polito. And on behalf of the administration, we're here this evening uh, at the Brookline Council on Aging for this wonderful event. So I'm speaking tonight at this event and I'm going to be talking about the importance of age-friendly communities and the work that has been done here in Brookline, which has been phenomenal. Uh, they're really one of the leading communities and were some of the best practice uh, best practices for a lot of other communities to follow in terms of how to make communities livable for people of all ages, all income levels, all racial and ethnic groups, and to really, um, you know, work across many different uh, sectors in the community, the business community, healthcare, advocates, older adults themselves, family members to uh, come together around making a community the best place to grow old. So I think power of engagement refers to people really promoting what it means to age well and be part of a community as each of us ages, whether we have uh, Alzheimer's disease and dementia, whether we're a family caregiver, as I myself am a family caregiver of someone who has Alzheimer's disease, whether we're healthy or have a disability, maybe need a wheelchair for mobility, need a little help getting around. People age in different ways and so the power of engagement means that every single person, regardless of ability, mental health, cognitive health, physical health issues, has an opportunity to speak out about the, the power of communities coming together to really promote ways that we can, um, you know, come together around issues such as getting older, making our communities really livable for people of all ages. Not real. 
my name is Betsy Munzer, and I am president of the League of Women Voters of Brookline, and that's why I'm here. And we're giving out information about the League and about our opening meeting, which is on October 18th in the Selectman's Meeting Room. Well, we're connected to BCAN because BCAN is giving us an award tonight for being an organization that seniors would enjoy joining and would enjoy participating in. And so that's why we're, that's one of the reasons that we're here. Power enga of engagement is just critical to the world. When we vote, because voting is the primary issue for the League of Women Voters, we make decisions for ourselves, for our children, and for the future. And every single vote counts. Voting, democracy, is not a spectator sport. It's a participatory start sport, and it's really important for people to be engaged. We also do programs uh, that help voters be informed about what the issues are, what the candidates are, and why you should vote. Is there anything else you might want to plug? Well, I think you should all join the League of Women Voters because it's a wonderful organization and allows you to work with an immense variety of men and women who are committed to Brookline and committed to making a difference here in Brookline. Um, so my name is Carrie Ann Tester and I represent TRIPS, which is an acronym for Transportation Resources Information planning and partnership for seniors. So we do not provide transportation service, but we do provide support for seniors who are looking for ways to get around without driving. Um, these are seniors who may still already be driving or seniors who have given it up or seniors who are in the process of giving it up. Sure, um, yeah, so uh, we're here tonight because we take every opportunity to interact with, with the public and to um, not only tell people what we do, but also listen to their stories and, and hear what they need and what, uh, how we can help them. So uh, any opportunity we can get to do that is a great opportunity and we're really pleased to be getting the award as well. That, that's really, uh, it's a nice acknowledgement of the work and the importance of supporting seniors here in Brookline. Sure, absolutely. Um, so it's, it's key to what we do. So we try to engage um, on, on lots of different levels. So we try to engage on an individual level. Our volunteers uh, provide one-to-one -one support. So we, uh, we engage seniors with other seniors who are already getting around in ways um, without driving. And we try to engage with organizations. We try to engage with um, families and caregivers and just members of the community. Um, the corporate presence here in Brookline can be very supportive. Uh, we've gotten a lot of support from a lot of businesses and local organizations. So um, engagement is, it's, it's a powerful tool to get done what we need to get done. And we, yeah, we feel that we kind of do the same thing that Brookline Can does, where we give a voice to people who are having all these individual experiences out there in the world and we bring them together and we gather the experiences, document the experiences, and try to, to, to change the world and make it a better place through that power of coming together. Yeah. Awesome. Here of the Council on Aging, and the most important thing I'd like to say to you all is welcome to our house. The Council on Aging basically is the senior center and the support and uh, partner of the Brookline Community Aging Network. So welcome to our house. Thank you. Our program today is always something very special for us because it's an opportunity to say thank you in many, many ways to the people who we see regularly and who we feel supported by. And 
I'd like to introduce now Ruth Ann Dobek, who is the director of the Senior Center and the co-chair of Brook Farm Community Aging Network, and Frank Caro, who is the co-chair of the Brook Farm Community Aging Network. Thank you. Thank you, Roberta. It is my pleasure also to warmly welcome all of you in attendance. This evening is Brookline Community Aging Network's opportunity to thank all the volunteers who contribute to hopefully recruit new volunteers so that we can continue and sustain our important work in making Brookline an age-friendly and livable community for all and to share in community with our neighbors. It's a wonderful evening to do all of those things. It is my great pleasure to introduce a very special guest that we have this evening. We have the distinct privilege of having in house the Secretary of Elder Affairs, Alice Bonner. Please give her a warm Brookline welcome. are so fortunate in the Commonwealth of Massachusetts to have an advocate and activist in the likes of Alice. Alice has devoted her entire nursing career to older adults. She worked as a professor of nursing in Northeastern. She was in the Obama administration in Medicare and nursing home regulation and since 2015 has led the Commonwealth in the activities of dementia-friendly, age-friendly, and ensuring that the Commonwealth meets its obligation to older adults. So once again, please welcome our special guest, Alice. Thank you so much, and this is just wonderful to be here this evening. And I bring, um, I see I brought the rain. This was so beautiful when I drove over. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, I bring greetings from Governor Baker and Lieutenant Governor Polito. They have heard about your work. They have heard about Brookline. They've heard about how you are leading the Commonwealth in age-friendly practices. And I was out here, Ruth Ann and Frank helped me out, was it uh, almost two years ago, I think, or a year and a half, when age-friendly Newton was coming along and you guys had been mentoring them and helping them because of what you've already learned about powerful engagement that you're talking about tonight and about, I love how you have the word community in your name, and that's the first thing, is this is about communities. When we talk about age-friendly, it is not about older people, it's about communities creating environments that are livable for people of all ages. It's about inclusivity. It's about intergenerational activities, and so many of these wonderful activities that you have here in Brookline. But I remember you guys talking about a very simple intervention that you did here, which was someone compiled a list of the places in town where they would allow a public restroom, a restroom to be used by the public so that, you know, if you couldn't make it back to your home, there was a place that you knew you could count on and they weren't gonna say, sorry, you didn't buy anything here or eat anything here. And what you told us was that not only did this help if you were someone who maybe had some urgency, but it helped a lot with mothers and, and dads with toddlers who also couldn't wait to get home. So again, it's that concept of longevity. When we talk about creating communities that are vibrant and powerfully engage one another, it is not just about 
older people. I, I wonder about your thoughts, because I hear a question a lot across the Commonwealth about community centers versus senior centers. And I hear, I hear people who have differing opinions on this, and towns and cities make different decisions. But you know, if you have a place and one resource in your town, or a limited amount of money to spend in your town, do you create a community center for all ages? And if you do that, how do you make sure that people who are older adults continue to have access to the resources and the activities and the things that they want and need and that you know they are they they are not feeling like they're being crowded out by younger people coming in. And again I've heard people say to me, I love the intergenerational activities. I I'm so happy we have a community center and the senior center becomes part of that. And we've had other towns that say, I'm so happy we have a place just for seniors. So as, as your secretary, because I work for you, um, I would love to know your thoughts and how we can promote and support all of the different activities and the different choices, because I think it's really about local choice. We fund councils on aging, we fund senior centers, as you know, based on the numbers of older adults in cities and towns, and based on some service incentive grants for special projects. And it's really important to us to hear from you about what you think is important here in Brookline, what you'd like to see happen in the future. Uh, you're a member of the Massachusetts Council on Aging Network, all 350, well, Monroe does not have a senior center, so it's not 351, it's 350 they share with a neighboring town. But you know, we represent all of the cities and towns, and we really believe in local choices, local decision making, and hearing from you. We went around the state this summer. I went with Secretary Mary Lou Sutters. We went to the Cape, the Berkshires, Worcester, and Gloucester for listening sessions because Governor Baker has a council that he appointed, and it's a council to address aging in Massachusetts. I hope you've all heard about it. We have a website, a portal, and you can submit a request, you can submit an idea, a recommendation, and the council reads every single one of them. So if you have thoughts, it's aging.conversation, or you can just go to our website, which is the Governor's Council to Address Aging, and let us know what you think. What are the biggest issues? I can tell you what we heard about across the Commonwealth, because there were some very clear themes. People talked about wanting to stay in their community, even as their needs might increase. They want to stay maybe in their own home, or stay at least in their Brookline community, if this is where they're from. Uh, people said they're worried about their economic security. Can I afford the, the real estate taxes, the property taxes? Can I continue to pay my rent? And all of the other things that you have to you know, pay for, food and medications and you know, a, a few little sundries. So we know that that's on people's minds. People talked about affordable, accessible housing and how Massachusetts Housing costs are high, and also we don't always have affordable, accessible housing in some of our communities. People talked a lot about transportation and the challenges of being older and maybe not driving anymore, and not necessarily, Brookline has pretty good public transportation, but when, it's still a need. And when we were out in the Berkshires, you know, people are very far from anything, and there is, you know, they don't have the ride, they don't have the MBTA. Uh, people talked about being a caregiver, and I bet a lot of people here are caring for someone in your family, and the challenges that caregivers face, especially if someone has dementia or Alzheimer's disease, and I know our keynote speaker tonight has done research uh, in that area, so it's very important. Uh, one out of eight people in the Commonwealth it is going to develop Alzheimer's disease, so it's a very significant problem for us and one we really want to address and be supportive of caregivers. Uh, we need workers in our nursing homes, assisted living, in home care, and there's fewer and fewer people available right now, so we have to really think 
about how to get more folks interested in working in direct care. Um, so those were some of the major themes that we heard about, and we're going to be coming up with some recommendations. And as I said, the website is aging.conversation at state.ma.us. Um, we can absolutely make sure that Ruthann and the council has that information. Um, so if you have a question about how to get in touch with us, you can certainly write to them. So I would just end, yes sir? So the website is the Governor's Council to Address Aging. Thank you for that. So the gentleman said that I was, I guess what I did was I just Googled it. That's why. So if you Google aging.conversation, it'll pop up. But the website is the Governor's Council to Address Aging, and that, that should pop up. So uh, again, I just want to end by saying how much we value hearing from you being out here in the community. I, I go to a lot of councils on aging. I always enjoy uh, speaking in communities with people who are doing great work like Ruthann and the team here. Uh, and again, I really want you to know that people are hearing about Brookline. You are out there in front doing age-friendly work right at the beginning of what is becoming a movement across the state. We are gaining momentum. More and more communities are realizing we have to combat ageism and we have to create positive views of what is optimal aging. What, if, what does every one of us want for ourselves as we get older? We want to age well, we want to be in our community, we want to stay connected and engaged. So I'm really glad you're going to hear about all of those things tonight. So I get to introduce your wonderful keynote speaker, who I just met for the first time, but I can't believe our paths haven't crossed. Uh, she is, uh, her name is Judith Gagne. She's a PhD and a professor and associate dean of research at Boston University School of Social Work. And she received her MSW and PhDs from the University of Washington in Seattle. And she's going to talk to us tonight and her background is in aging. She's done research on homeless women, on people with Alzheimer's disease and caregivers and many, many other topics. So we're so delighted you're here and it's great to meet you. So welcome Dr. Godwin. Projects 
can be replicated in other communities or organizations throughout the state or the nation. And there's evidence, as Alice said, that you've been incredibly strong partners with Newton in moving forward in their age-friendly initiative. Unfortunately, we also know that at the completion of a demonstration project and the disappearance of its original funding, the initiatives often cease to exist, or at the very least are substantially downsized. That's why I think it's incredibly important that tonight we celebrate Brooklyn Kent's success. <coughs> Amongst those successes is that the town has established the Age Friendly Cities Committee to inform and advise the Board of Selectmen on initiatives to strengthen Brookline's commitment to creating a livable community for all residents. And I think Alice's comment is an especially important one, this issue of labels and names. What do people want to be called? We know that one third of people in their 70s say they're not seniors. <laughs> we know as people get older, they keep rising what is that marker of old age? I've been to a number of community meetings and we struggle with in outreach and bringing people in. What term should we use? <coughs> Senior? Retiree? It, it is a dilemma as to what words create a welcoming and what words create a barrier. So I think that's a struggle all groups have, and that's why some people have suggested the emphasis on livable communities for all ages. Good sidewalks without cracks work for persons as they age with walkers, but they also work for mothers or fathers with baby carriages. Um, it's also important to recognize that Brookline has had incredible success through uh, becoming an accepted member of the World Health Organization International Net uh, excuse me, the World Health Organization's International Network of Age-Friendly Cities. So you're connected not only locally and within the state, but globally, because the issue of aging is a global issue. As I thought about the successes that Brookline Ken has had, I began to think, what are the factors that have contributed to the, your success? What is the message you can give to other organizations or towns that are thinking about how they can move forward to become more age-friendly? And what struck me were four factors, and I'm sure you all can identify other important factors, but I think first, an important factor that's contributed to Brookline Ken's success is that it is truly a local public and private partnership. The town's age-friendly uh, communities committee, the Council on Aging, Brookline Ken, it's obvious that you've developed a wonderful collaborative relationship. Second, a second factor is, I believe, the emergence of leaders from both sectors, public and private, who are passionate advocates. Clearly, persons like Ruthann and Frank have been powerful leaders in taking the message of age-friendly forward and out into the community. A third factor I think has been critical is that is that of the accessibility of membership. Going to once the website, you clearly see that Brookline Can is trying to be an open and welcoming organization to all residents. And membership is affordable. So it's money economics is not a barrier. Fourth, I think a key factor that has perhaps contributed to your success is that you've chosen to focus on practical, results-oriented projects that have meaningful impact on local residents' everyday lives. There's nothing more basic than finding a bathroom when you need it. 
I'm sure that many of you have additional ideas and thoughts about what have been the important elements or factors that have led to Brooklyn and Ken's current success and may have insights about what factors are going to be important in carrying Brookline Ken forward into the next decade. Currently, the national spotlight has been focused on the deep divisions in our society. I'm currently the, the dean at interim at Boston University School of Social Work. In welcoming new and returning students to the new academic year, I noted that the start of this academic year was like, unlike any other in recent memory. The events of Ch uh, Charlottesville were powerful reminders of the dangers of hate speech, symbols, and actions. Further, it's become increasingly evident that many individuals and families in our country are currently living with fear whether with fears or concerns about the possibility, uh, the possible elimination of the Affordable Care Act or Obamacare, the elimination of DACA, gun violence, or the terrible um, impacts of the opioid epidemic, just to name a few. In fact, much of public attention is now focused on how we simply preserve current programs like Medicare and Medicaid or how do we protect individuals' rights? Largely absent from the news or public discourse really has been the importance of age-friendly communities. It's somewhat out of the spotlight right now. Yet, I believe there are ways to continue to, com to promote the importance of transforming our communities to be more age-friendly. And I believe one such way centers on the fact that loneliness is increasingly being seen as a serious public health hazard in our country. I believe we can do a better job in explaining the role that age-friendly communities can play in addressing this issue, this public health threat. Indeed, scientists who have identified the link between loneliness and illness are discovering that social isolation changes the human genome in profound and long-lasting ways, and that the genetic changes appear comparable to the injuries to health from cigarette smoking and are even worse than the injuries to health from diabetes and obesity. Researchers have known for years that lonely people are at greater risk for heart attacks, cancer, Alzheimer's, and other diseases, but they haven't understood why. Recently, a research at, excuse me, researchers at UCLA Medicine, University of California Davis, and University of Chicago, working in collaboration, may have found a part of the answer to this question. They found that social isolation turned up the activity of genes responsible for inflammation and turned down the activity of genes that produce antibodies. Public health advocates have noted that in the US, we talk all the time about cigarette smoking and obesity and we have developed a wide number of interventions targeting these health risks. But we do very little for people who are lonely and socially isolated. Yet, lonely people are often less healthy, they are heavier utilizers of healthcare services, and ultimately, they're costing our society more. In my own work recently with lower income adults 55 and older living in subsidized housing developments, I found that loneliness greatly increased the risk of experience, experiencing depression, while a sense of belonging was a protective factor. 
In other words, older, subsidized housing residents who felt a stronger sense of connection to their neighbors and their neighborhood reported feeling both safer and less depressed. The reality is the U.S. values individualism and is doing far too little to alleviate the lethal risk of loneliness. Perhaps this issue is best summarized by Dr. Paris Nitok names. I wish we could cut the tape right now. Um, Dr. Carla Paramisoto, a geriatrician at University of California, San Francisco. She said, and I quote her, it is no longer medically or ethically acceptable to ignore older adults who feel lonely and marginalized. <coughs> at the core of creating age-friendly communities is having all the building blocks in place, such as affordable and accessible housing, health care, and transportation, as well as adequate ret retirement income. These are the things that Alice just shared, that when they went on these conversations across the state, this is what they heard was important to persons aging in their communities. These building blocks allow older adults to be socially engaged and find personal meaning in their lives. Indeed, inclusion is at the heart of age-friendly communities. The words of social inclusion and social exclusion are in fact often mentioned in conversations about age-friendly communities, yet they're rare, rarely explored in depth. I thought I would end tonight by offering a framework of seven dimensions of social exclusion, which may offer Brookline Ken an opportunity to develop a more comprehensive understanding of how power dynamics within a community can impact different factors in older residents' lives. These different dimensions or different types of exclusion include symbolic exclusion. Symbolic ex exclusion promotes the invisibility or negative images of aging. For example, old means burdensome. With young students, at the, with my students at the university, I often ask them, what is aging about? And one of the things I often find discouraging is they say it's about the four Ds. Disability, depression, dementia, and death. This is probably a wonderful example of symbolic exclusion. <laughs> Another type of exclusion is identity exclusion. That is the reduction of a person's identity to a single group, their old. Ignoring that each of us has multiple social identities we can be social activists, we can be gardeners, we can be fishermen. There are so many roles and identities we take on. Identity exclusion is when you are reduced to just a single identity. Sociopolitical exclusion, the existence of barriers to civic and political participation. As Alice was talking, and I've been doing work, as I said, in subsidized housing, I know many don't have computers or access to a computer, so I was thinking about their ability to go into that porthole and leave comments. So I think we have to think about how we create multiple ways for voices to be heard. Institutional exclusion, the lack or limited access to formal services. We often think about this as health services, but it could be library resources, recreational resources, educational and cultural programs. Alice's comment and question about whether people want a community center or senior centers is an interesting one. Recently, I was in New York City and they've done something where the pool is available to all, but there's certain hours at the pool that are restricted for 
older adults. We wanted a little less chaos in the pool. Um, so there's ways to think through these things and remove barriers. Economic exclusion, limited or inadequate financial resources compromises one's safety and security, health, and well-being. And exclusion of social ties, a limited or shrinking of social networks. One of the things we found in our research is that even though people often age in place, their own neighborhood and street or apartment building changes dramatically. So even when you age in place, your social network can shrink. And finally, territorial exclusion. Limited residential choice in neighborhoods, limited affordable accessible living arrangements within neighborhoods, and then simply unsafe neighborhoods. The slogan, Act Locally, Think Globally, clearly represents Brookline's commitment to join the World Health Organization's global network of age-friendly cities. I believe that organizations such as Brookline can, a volunteer organization of socially engaged residents, have the power to transform their community and in particular give voice to those who are less powerful, powerful as well as build bridges to older adults who are more isolated and alone. Congratulations on your success to date and best wishes as you move forward. Thank you. Hi, I'm, I'm Frank Carroll. We're going to move on to the awards portion of the, of the, of the evening. And, you know, I should say I want to you know, thank Judith for her inspiring presentation. She did a wonderful job of pulling some things uh, together for us. But just one little observation that I want to make is that you know, she made re reference to our, our restroom project. I want to call attention to the fact that the idea from that project came from a Brookline CAN member who was a member of the Liverpool Community Advocacy Committee. Uh, we, we did that project at the suggestion of one of our members. Uh, and that's kind of one of, the, one of our strengths as an organization is that we involve people in the community, we welcome their suggestions, and we look for ways to act on the good ideas that they bring to us. So, uh, you know, for those who are, of you who are not yet involved, uh, we encourage you to, 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 to get involved and be part of our effort uh, to call attention to the good things that Brookline offers and to, and to work with us to make things better. Uh, we, we, we're fortunate this evening to, to be able to uh, present awards uh, to uh, three organizations that have, uh, that, have that contribute a great deal. Uh, to, to Brookline Community Life, who, who are really involved uh, in providing citizens with an opportunity to participate in, meaningfully in community affairs. And uh, I will start uh, with the Brookline Interactive Group. Um, and uh, with, uh, okay, we're looking for Aaron to come up to be the recipient of the award. Absolutely loved working with you guys, and um, you know we've done a lot of really great things, and we're looking forward to the future and more collaborations. Thank you, guys. to get information across to the community. 
uh, about um, issues that are important to seniors and that we, we receive wonderful technical support uh, from Big and Indiana. We're very, very appreciative. And so our uh, second award is the second award is to the League of Women Voters. Uh, and we're very appreciative of all that the, the League does to uh, encourage uh, people to, uh, to be active uh, in the electoral uh, process to, you know, to exercise the right to vote. Um, and, um, Together, where we have uh, Betsy Munzer here with us to receive the award. First of all, um, I would like to refer back to Judith's speech about civic engagement being so important. And that's what the League of Women Voters is about. And we're even more effective at civic engagement if each of you become a member of the League of Women Voters. <laughs> Our number one focus is on getting people to vote. Not just to vote, but to cast an educated vote. So that you understand both sides of the story because we are a nonpartisan group and we will tell you all the warts and the jewels on both sides of the story. Not only should you join the league, but you should join us <clears throat> at our October 18th in Town Hall, sixth floor, speaking about, uh, Miles Rappaport will speak on democracy at crossroads. And this is the way you can keep your civic engagement at a high level.
So Maria and all of our volunteers work really hard every day to help seniors explore all these different options. And one thing they really do is they make it fun and exciting and an adventure. There's Ruth, one of our great uh, founding volunteers. Um, and I wanted to also thank Frank and Shirley Selhub, another one of our volunteers, Ruth Ann and Jane Colino and Newton, who helped us get started. So thank you very much. And if you want to join us, we've got uh, brochures. We can give you a brochure and uh, come join us. Thank you. Thank you. So, I, we're only three minutes late. <laughs> I want to be sure that you know how much we appreciate your being here and how much we appreciate your helping us all to share with the different definitions of our being this evening, the power of engagement. It means get involved, be part of something, join your friends, move around more. We welcome you here at the Senior Center. We also expect to say hello to you as we're walking around Brookline. And I have to add something that's a total non sequitur. I used to be a runner, and one of the things I learned running around the streets in Brookline and Newton was there's always a place to use a public restroom and that's in a fire station. Do you know that? <laughs> they're always clean they're, and they're very welcoming. So you learned a lot, you learned a lot, some things you may not have known, but thank you again. Have a nice day.